Okay. Hello, I'm Anna Farka, writer and producer, and I invite you to talk in tandem, an online show depicting, re depicting relationships. Today, guests are Professor Sam Wagner, author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and his lovely wife and editor, Lydia Rangelowska. Sam, Tim Hall from New York Press called you the leading expert on narcissism. I'm guessing that just a small part of it is sustained by your personal experience, and a lot of it is sustained by the thousands of interviews you made around the years. Uh, could you please walk us through, through your journey with narcissism? Yes, I was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. I've been diagnosed twice, once in the 80s and once in the 90s. The first time because of a woman and the second time because of prison. And I can't see the difference usually. <laughs> But the first time my fiancé had abandoned me um, in, in the United Kingdom, so we had agreed to go to couple counselling in Canada, in more places. So we were travelling to Canada every week from the United Kingdom. And there, a, an Israeli psychologist who was then residing in Canada, diagnosed me with narcissistic personality disorder. This was 1985. This was only five years after the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder was first formally recognized in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 3. No one knew anything about it. There was nothing written about it. No one knew what, what they're talking about. So it was very difficult for the psychologist to explain to me what my problem was. He just said, you seem to fit the criteria. So I dismissed him, of course. I devalued him. I said, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not credential. I know much more about psychology than he does. Plus, I'm much better looking. So, <laughs> and that was the end of that. Then in 1995, I found myself in prison. I, I used to be a very big businessman and I owned a bank and I misbehaved with the bank and I found myself in prison. And in prison, it was obligatory to be evaluated by a psychiatrist in order to go on probation, on parole. So I was interviewed by a psychiatrist and he told me, listen, you have narcissistic personality disorder. Now, that was a lot later. That was already in 1995. There were already some studies, not many, 92, 94. There were a few studies, maybe five, maybe 10, and I'm not exaggerating. That was the maximum. And so I had some literature to start with. And then I went backwards. I went back, I, 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 was, I had a disease. I had cancer of the soul. And there was no written literature. I, I needed to understand what was wrong with me because I lost my wife and my life. I lost my money, I lost my reputation, I lost everything to this disease. And so I went back and I studied the work of, I started with Freud. Freud was the first to write about Narcissism in 1914. And then I continued all the way to Kohut, uh, Heinz Kohut and, and Otto Kernberg and so on, but these people, stopped writing about narcissism. The last time they had written anything about narcissism was 1974. Do you remember when I was... the first book you read? Sorry? You remember the first book you read on the topic when you had... The first, the first book I read on the topic was uh, Alexander Lowen's book um, about narcissism. It was a 1974 super popular book, not very serious, mind you. And it was followed by Scott Peck, the road less traveled. And yes. Scott Peck said that narcissists are demonic and they are the reification of evil on earth. I didn't find it a very convincing, clin clinically convincing argument. So there was no serious literature. It was nonsense. In 1995, while I was in prison, I had written the first draft of my book, Malignant Self Love, Narcissism Revisited. It was written by candlelight at night in the cell, in the cell with 10 other men. Mm -hmm. And then when I got out of prison, I met Lydia in Macedonia and she established the first website ever for narcissism. That was the first website on the web ever. This and for nine years, for nine years, it was the only website yeah. on the web for nine years. And so for nine years, I was trying to educate people about what is narcissism? What is a narcissist? How the narcissist affects himself and and his loved ones. So that's how it all that's how it all started. I'm sorry it was a bit long, but I wanted to give you the whole the whole uh, sequence. And since then, of course, it became a global movement. There are more than 40 million people in narcissistic abuse support groups. Narcissistic abuse is a phrase that I coined in 1997 because I realized that the abuse 
meted out by narcissists is not like other forms of abuse. It's very, very different. And we can discuss, discuss yeah. it a bit later. Lydia can provide, I think, the perspective of the 1997 to the publishing of the book, which is 1999, the first edition of Malignant Self Love, the first book ever on narcissistic abuse was in 1999. And it was because of her. I threw it to the garbage. I didn't want to publish it, mm -hmm. to publish it. Yeah, it's actually, uh, how did you make when I uh, When I met him, uh, I, I already had some insights of unstable and already recognized uh, family dynamics that that is my family that was my family and there were many questions that I couldn't find an answer I when I met Sam there were some answers uh, something was resonating of what he was saying what he was what we were talking discussing among each other uh, while introducing <laughs> each other to each to to each one of us, so uh, there were many elements that were uh, that I noticed and resonated with what I went through just uh, a year or less than a year before, and uh, it was after I was traumatized the previous year before I met him, a year before I met him that I had uh, like nine very close and family members that died and I lost them. I lost them as people, as beloved ones. And I stayed uh, with uh, people who were brutal, um, brutal. I can use, today I can use that word, but I didn't know why. So with the, uh, communicating with Sam and uh, him explaining me what he was going through while writing the book, how he spent his life, what happened to him, I could have made a difference. And it was challenging because uh, finally there were some answers to the unknown and uh, stabilized me emotionally. I felt more sure it's better to know the ugly truth than to live in a, in a bubble mm -hmm. where you actually lost your you know, beliefs. Uh, that I, I caught myself distrusting anyone, mm -hmm. being alone. And it was time to make a decision uh, about myself, where to go, what to do, what, uh, where to focus, and so on. So this subject became very intriguing, interesting. And uh, there were interest, uh, many people got interest in the subject. And uh, this group that, man, uh, that Sam mentioned grew and all the time they were asking questions. So the book has a section of frequently asked questions. These are the, uh, from that group that people were talking, asking. They, they uh, were also dealing and going through something with their beloved ones, with their families. And it was, it was a, a very pleasant uh, feeling, pleasant feeling that uh, I found myself also helping in a way uh, to answer and to make clear uh, their standing in their families and beloved ones, because I know what I went through. And uh, the subject of narcissism was giving answers to the feelings. Actually, they validated my emotions mm -hmm. as other people were saying. So we were not, and it was interesting to see uh, that they were fighting for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not just, okay, I will avoid the question. I will not tackle. They were brave women mostly that they seek answers and uh, I was, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they actually suggested why not to publish a book. So we did publish a book, but we found ourselves uh, then in Prague. So the book was, the first edition of the book was published there. So because they said, I, I don't want to read from, uh, to search for, 
for the answers on the internet. I need a book to open it and just to what to to check what is good for us, what is good for me. So it is, you know, it, th there was good enough reason why to get involved in all this business, sort of. You know, to publishing the book. To, to complete the answer, with your permission, uh, one more sentence. To complete the answer, since then, I, I started to ask people who had been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder to approach me and to be included in a database. So I administer a questionnaire of 682 questions that I have. Anyone who wants to be included must provide a letter from a diagnostician mm -hmm. attesting that he had been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder and which tests were used. So I insist usually on MMPI 2 and NPI 2 tests. I saw in the book. You should read the his book. Because yes, and then they're included in the database. Today there's 1,876. Yesterday, actually, there's another three today. So about 1,900. And each one is un had answered a questionnaire of 682 questions. And then each year, there's another questionnaire of 50, 50 to something. 50 something questions. Mm -hmm. So I have the largest by far database in the world about narcissistic personality disorder with more than 1 billion data points about every conceivable dimension, emotions, sexuality, interpersonal relationships, empathy, intimacy, absolutely everything. My work is based on this database by now. I, I am diluted, I disappeared in the, in the story. And, and actually most of what I say about narcissists doesn't apply to me. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I understood. But the question that pops to my mind is this: with the entire entire knowledge you have, they normally pinpointed the term um, trauma bonding. In your case, it's about healing bonding, which I understand because you both had narcissists in your life. Or I also did. Interesting is that by knowing the dynamic and by recognizing it, you can literally have that support group bigger and bigger and bigger and help people have awareness on the topic. My question that popped in was this, do all families that face narcissistic abuse have this side of uh, seclusion, of being a bit redrawn through the world or are there very ongoing families like the celebrities you see? So are they always compact or sometimes mingle in with normal families? It depends on the narcissist. There is a typology of narcissists. So there is the overt narcissist. The overt narcissist is not self-aware mm -hmm. of anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Or if he is aware of his abrasive and antisocial behaviors, he would tend to glorify or glamorize these behaviors. He would tend to say, I'm the next, <coughs> I'm the next stage in evolution. I'm superior to other people. And the overt narcissist is usually what you call a celebrity type. <laughs> if the overt narcissist is extroverted, life of the party, charming, outgoing, gregarious, and usually embedded in families which provide the support for these kind of behaviors. Mm -hmm. is also much more likely to engage in substance abuse and in reckless and defiant behaviors. So he is much closer, the overt narcissist is much closer to the psychopathic pole of narcissism, to psychopathic narcissist or malignant narcissist. The other type of narcissist, the other major type, because there are many types, but the other major type is the covert, shy, fragile, vulnerable narcissist, which was first described in 1989. And the, I contributed a lot to describing this type. And I, I came up with the inverted narcissist, which is a subtype of covert narcissist. Anyhow, the covert narcissist is withdrawn because he cannot obtain supply Normally, he is very frustrated, resentful, envious, passive aggressive, um, seething, conspiratorial, scheming, and very, in, in this sense, it's very toxic. With somatic and. So there are many other types. Somatic and cerebral is a typology that I suggested. And I, I th simply realized that some narcissists obtain supply by leveraging their intelligence and their intellect. They show they are intellectually pyrotechnic. Mm -hmm. They show you how clever they are, how amazing, how smart, how brilliant, and so on. And they get your admiration and adulation. And so, on. so this is cerebral narcissist. And cerebral narcissist would would deny his body. He he would not pay attention to his body. He would neglect himself. He would never never exercise. He would rarely, if ever, have sex. It's like he is bodiless because his his supply comes from his mind. 
So he pays, he puts all his resources in his mind. The somatic is the opposite. It's a narcissist like who, a body. yes, leverages his body. So he would body build or he would dress very well or he would have sex endlessly and incessantly or anything to do with the body. Or he would be athletic, super athletic and so on. That way he would get supplied. That way people or women would appreciate or admire him. These are, this is another typology, but there are many other typologies. For example, very important typology that is, that is just being coming out is high functioning versus low functioning. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I read in the book there are some that seem zombies, some that seem... So high functioning narcissists are narcissists who despite their disorder or because of their disorder mm -hmm. succeed in society. The disorder becomes a positive adaptation. They use their disorder to climb to the top, to become pillars of the community, to make money, become successful, to get women, you know? So these are high functioning. Low functioning narcissists are narcissists whose disorder disrupts their functioning in a variety of contexts and settings. So we're beginning to make this uh, distinction. So the field of narcissism is just evolving. Another distinction that I was, I, I suggested in 2000 is between the pro-social narcissist and the antisocial narcissist. They are narcissists who are altruistic, mm -hmm. charitable, giving. Of um, they are part, they are pillars of the community. They are part of society. They, they are morally upright. They never do anything wrong. They are always... So these narcissists, for example, religious leaders, mm -hmm. they, they get their supply by being moral, mm -hmm. by being pro-social. So I suggested the, the division between antisocial narcissists and pro-social narcissists. Narcissism is in all of us. Mm -hmm. We all have healthy narcissists. And exactly like a normal cell, a cell can become cancerous and malignant. Healthy narcissism can easily become malignant and so on. So consequently, it infects everyone. It's an equal opportunity contagion. So you have pro-social, anti-social, somatic, cerebral, this, high function. I mean, anyone can become narcissist. When I read the and book, there are en and there are endless combinations. Yeah. You mentioned trauma only. Mm -hmm. uh, people remember traumas much more mm -hmm. than uh, joyful moments. Yeah, true. We have a mindset. So we we by nature connect more mm -hmm. to the traumatic. Uh, that's why the trauma bonding is much more firm than, uh, than uh, because of the element in narcissism that, mo that we are not uh, actually sure in ourselves. Because of our inner uncertainties, we have this narcissistic defense mechanism. And if we don't uh, have, uh, if we don't value ourselves, if our self-esteem is underestimated by the, the environment, then we are shifting. And the line is very thin to cross and become, uh, up, actually to upgrade ourselves, to be more narcissistic, more grandiose. So in time, as we are getting experiences, especially remembering the trauma, and we are more tra traumatized, uh, we uh, develop more narcissistic traits, you know, and uh, in my country, at least, we say that, yes, older people are to be listened, heard mm -hmm. about their experiences, but also they are selfish. In time, they learn mm -hmm. from their traumatic experience. Yeah, they speak from trauma. Okay, that they are more selfish. So the first sign is that uh, of the narcissist is selfishness. What you noticed, you, you would say selfish person, not selfish in giving, but also sharing, emotional sharing. Mm -hmm. They won't validate and they won't validate for you, your own emotions. They are more rigid in uh, trying to understand what you are saying. You are honest, emotion, you will emotionally open, you will share with them how you feel in order to uh, share or asking for their validation so you will adapt yourself more to the environment you would like to know more about yourself but they are abusing it selfish people 
abuse it, abuse that. It's, uh, they consider it your weakness. And uh, here is uh, uh, where I consider that if a person is not aware of narcissism generally about other people, mm -hmm. uh, they are not aware of their own narcissism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, what I see and I really don't like is when people say, oh, for example, about me, but you are his wife. You are dormant, you are uh, codependent. I was diagnosed, I don't know in what. I said, look, I feel okay with myself, you know, because of my past, because of the environment, because of my own values. We are all different. You can't just label someone. So it's very wrong, very wrong uh, to go uh, to, uh, to take, uh, to diagnose someone without uh, uh, taking into consideration the upbringing, the cultural values, the environment, the conditions of life in the country that they live, mm -hmm. it's very wrong. And the, uh, I treat people, first thing, what I say, where are you calling, where, are you, wh where were you born? Mm -hmm. Which year were you born? There were different trends. The values were different. So you can't, uh, you, it, it's uh, not uh, uh, diagnosis of narcissism. It's not, ah, you are a narcissist. Uh, and uh, depends on many elements. Uh, also, uh, we change all the time. As the, as the survival conditions change in the environment, the traumas appear, disappear, we bond with other people in different levels, in different ways. So uh, distrust is enormous. These days, uh, people just withdraw. They don't trust each other. Even, you know, it's only also because of the virus <laughs> that is here. But woke them up. They are all afraid. We all are afraid to die. Mm -hmm. So that is our primary trauma. We actually trauma traumatize ourselves first. That's why we need, uh, we need uh, uh, narcissistic defenses. Mm -hmm. We are ashamed of ourselves, our insecurities. We doubt our values. Are we able, uh, can we do it? We suspect ourselves. Actually, there are no victims of narcissistic abuse. This is- We I are. Mean. Yeah. We are. Uh, victims of ourselves. It's a choice. Yes. It's a choice. It is victim so, of mentality. In Romania, so, it's very prevalent. I, I'm thinking, my guess is in your country also. He writes in the book that 50% to 75% are men. So I don't want to be... I don't want to be the lawyer of men. But in Romania, they have a thinking that says uh, strong men don't cry, etc, etc, etc. And it makes you feel weak when you feel vulnerable, but to such extent that they are a bit encouraged to be narcissistic in our country, to a big extent. And they also have the thinking, which I agree it's nice to cook and to be self-sufficient and to be a lady, but they have the, the idea that women should have no uh, healthy boundaries in relationships. Of they <laughs> it fits them. <laughs> what I also took from your book is that I have so many people that are always more sides of the story some of them have this victimhood mentality or they shame themselves and they say uh, if i would have been stronger or uh, if i would have been weaker I, I think that this is wrong why because from your book i take it that from the thousands of interviews you made there is no formula so there is no formula for a partner who chooses to be in a narcissistic relationship. It have, yes. has all sorts of dynamics, reasoning yes. underlying it. Yes. But uh, what I, I took from what you said is that there are too, so many faces of the story that uh, I, I'm very curious in time, in your relationship, for instance, if the underlying fear is this of abandonment, when you achieve something, Lydia, or, or when you have successes, do you feel encouraged? Because one thing that I see 
in this type of relationships is a uh, acute jealousy. Does it manifest or can it be contained? The jealousy of the narcissist. You can, uh, also, it, you can also free me. I will beat you yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll beat no, you up. No, this is also a, a, a topic very frequent in men. So I yes, it is. Uh, it's he's cerebral narcissist, mm -hmm. and he is grandiose. He knows all and better and best, and that is unbeatable. So, but it's the no, truth. It's the truth. <laughs> it is. I agree, uh, but. Mm, because he doesn't have, he actually, because he doesn't trust his instincts, mm -hmm. because he doesn't trust his urges, he did not accept his mm, needs, because he, uh, he doesn't accept them, because he has to sustain the image mm -hmm. that he created, and that is the driving force to support all, all the time to just push up to, to sustain that image that he has. We all have image of ourselves, but it's changeable. Uh, with the times, with the new information, we adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the difference with the narcissist. They are rigid. This is the word. The key word, in my understanding, they are rigid. They don't want the comfort zone. You heard about it, like they don't want to exit. And in every life coach will say exit the comfort zone in order for him to sustain that image he is not open to listen to hear he rejects someone else else's opinion but it's not that he did not hear and listen in order to sustain his own image that he is grandiose that he is the brain he will adopt he will adopt he will list. Uh, he would, but he won't say it's uh, it's uh, that he heard it from me. But like overnight, I came up with this. You know, it happened a few times, but it happens. So we are, you know, but it is like, and it's not jealousy. It's not jealousy, but because of their inner dynamic, uh, it is. It seems like jealousy to a person who doesn't understand the basics, how, how, what, what narcissist needs, how they function in a way, how, how much energy they need to sustain the image of themselves first. Then maybe if they are good, if they have time, if they are patient, they, they will hear when they will need to feed themselves with the, to supply themselves in order to sustain their image then they will listen very carefully they will be even curious and you will see you will think that they are in love with you they are so much they value your opinion and so on but uh it's not like that they use it for themselves and they glorify it only for themselves that makes them selfish and that's why we say the narcissists are selfish and they are devils but it's uh, not because of uh, jealousy. They are driven by envy, by their dark side. It's no, it not isn't. really jealousy. Okay. It's not really jealousy. We misinterpret. You know why I asked the question? You say so yeah. nicely in the beginning of the book, you dedicate the book to Lydia, and you talk to such high esteem that you can see it's made out of the best intentions. So I'm imagining a man not necessarily being jealous on the wife's accomplishments, but most cases this happens so. Like he discourages her, he puts her in far away from the light. But in the book, from the thing you said, like the first rounds when you, you mentioned her so highly, I feel like there are there is also the type of narcissist that says, Look, I have an amazing wife or girlfriend yeah. or this. It means I have good taste and I know how to pick a good yes, animation this, is, this is called this is called co-idealization this is what i the narcissist the narcissist idealizes his partner in order to idealize himself if if the narcissist has a super intelligent partner that means he's super intelligent because why would she be with him if he's not if he has an exceedingly beautiful woman he must be very attractive otherwise why would she be with him so 
This is a process of co-idealization. Whenever the narcissist idealizes his partner, whenever, for example, he pushes her to accomplish things, which I am doing with Lydia a lot, uh, this is in order to idealize himself, to feel better about himself. So this is a critical distinction. Narcissists, whatever they do, it's about themselves. The image yeah. that they created. Yeah. So if if uh, uh, if you have, how will I uh, explain it? No, no, no. Uh, uh, it's not jealousy. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. envy. Envy. So there, if imagine a cerebral narcissist knows it all. Who are you to tell me? Also, is a play power. He feels more strong, dominant. In animalistic terms, it's called dominance. So they have their controlling territory, including everything, including me, I mean, uh, the wife and the dogs and the household. They have to have everything under the control. We don't have dogs. <laughs> yeah, but we had a fish. I have a cat. Uh, and, she, and she died. <laughs> and she died. Of envy. <laughs> it was envy. So it's uh, uh, th then uh, if, if I, for example, uh, know when he needs something, I don't, I don't mind giving because that is my uh, background uh, that I am, uh, uh, I, I have this, like, I want to feel useful. I want to con contribute. I need at once help. You know, if people, if someone approaches me, maybe they need help. I know how I suffered when I was alone. So why not to uh, help someone who felt, who feels bad about himself or whatever. So I have this concept of need to be needed. My need is to be needed and useful. So people come and abuse it. Of course, they will take advantage. They, they but I don't mind because uh, to be used and abused because that is how I grew up. So I have this filtering uh, that I can't allow myself helping people. So I am myself uh, with these human elements because we don't live separately in atomization, that, uh, how it is today, for example. But I grew up with the other people. I was eating at my neighbors and it was uh, uh, much more tastier. So differences that I experienced in life to uh, confirm my values. Okay, not my mother, not my father, not other people, the experiences. But uh, narcissists, as opposed to narcissists, they're using people, other people, to validate their, their they don't have the sen uh, sense, they can't actually, they're incapable of experiencing the, uh, their lives. Uh, but uh, they need someone, uh, uh, he calls me external hard disk. Mm -hmm because I have to remember what we both experienced and I will tell him, this is your history. When we were, for example, in Budapest, we experienced this. So he lives, he lives through my okay. senses, my senses. I sense, I experience, and whenever he needs, I give it to him. I up upgrade him, I, 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 I update him for every moment. So uh, I'm his uh, narcissist secondary actually, uh, narcissistic supply according to his book. I don't mind being that because that is how I grew up. Of course, there are many elements mm -hmm. that I cannot, uh, uh, that I cannot uh, not say, but I cannot express. Mm -hmm. because uh, he, uh, he's not capable of understanding them, even to grasp them as they exist. Other people do. They connect, they talk. He doesn't trust his senses, but his senses, you know, the gut feeling. He doubts himself. He has very good instincts. He has an enormous capacity. Yeah. But 
he like he is afraid, terrified to listen to them. What is where this came from? So uh, uh, narcissists in general, they panic, and it, it's difficult for them even to decide upon something, to decide to make a decision, to do this or this, because they can't trust their senses, their instincts. That's why they need uh, secondary sources of supply to to know that they live. The via uh, via their sources of supply, they think that they live their lives, that they are alive. I verify, validate narcissist existence, mm -hmm. and I don't mind because, for example, Sam does a good job, mm -hmm. but there are some that they are not worth. It. So I try once, twice, three times. They don't have anything. I mean, they don't have any uh, any conscience. Uh, like they are disconnected completely. They they are not aware. You will hear them talking like there are some gurus. You know the cult leaders are like that, for example. But implementing it, like they are divorced from implementation. You know what uh, the image is there about themselves, but not implementing the things. Mm -hmm. Sam is not like that. So uh, this is the the difference. People should know about this, the small differences, but when you take all of them and you in a big picture, you fit them in a big picture, you will see uh, what the, uh, that they are really inhuman. They don't, because they don't, they, they suppress their human needs, their human values. They like negate themselves mm -hmm. and they need validation, constant validation from other people to feel that they, that they exist, that they are alive. What I took from the book, he, he did an amazing job describing the anxiety, anxiety, which he also talks about of the narcissist. Another amazing thing you did, when we talk about how the narcissist was created, you said like normally uh, the manual, the fifth edition, says that they are normally made through abuse. Uh, my experience is not through abuse, it's through uh, the hot and cold, the un, uh, unavailability. Uncertainty. And what I took from my childhood, childhood was, uh, was very hard for me to actually set the boundaries. This is how I ended up in a narcissistic relationship. So I, I was curious, Lydia, so you, you kind of managed to reinforce your personal boundaries. This was the question. Can you do this in the narcissistic relationship? But why, uh, why I ask the question? There are certain people, like Marisa Peer and others, that when they hear about narcissism, they say quit the relationship. Or, but you're talking to people who maybe have a transactional marriage, which is 20 years of age. They also have children together. And they try to manage their, not say their own unclarity, but they try to manage it in their own system. So I'm not uh, condoning it or condemning it. I just think every situation is distinct. This is why I wanted to, to understand because it's interesting there is an amount of incredible data in your book that helps people navigate the relationship and better understand and forget about the things that are laid around there. What I mean through this, you have in order for a person to be diagnosed as a narcissist, you have to have the five criteria from the nine. I hear so often the term narcissist that I think it's mentioned by anyone who had a bad relationship uh, when they, they themselves, maybe they're histrionic or have a certain dependent personality and they mm -hmm. cannot establish personal boundaries and they say, oh, he was a narcissist playing the victim card. Oh, she was. Maybe the person saying it is actually a narcissist. Yeah, and I was exactly. curious if you could walk us through the nine criteria okay. that you must meet five of them in order to be actually diagnosed. The nine criteria uh, are about to be abolished, actually. Yeah. The nine criteria first appeared in 1994 in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Manual Edition 4. Actually, they appeared in Edition 3, but they were modified massively. And then in the text revision in 2000. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 5 on page 767 has an alternative model 
of narcissism, of narcissistic personality disorder. And this alternative model is the new diagnostic model, which will be in DSM-6. So there's not much point to talk about uh, the nine criteria because they have been long ago, more than 20 years ago, discredited, and they are not used by serious scholars in the field anymore. Well over six to 10 years, no one is using them anymore. They've been long discredited because they're wrong. For example, one of the criteria is that narcissists have no empathy. Today we know that they do. One of the criteria is that uh, narcissists um, are envious. Today we know, we know that there are big groups of narcissists who are not envious and so on. So one could say that big parts of the criteria are probably wrong. Today with, with, with current research, including empathy. Yes, narcissists have empathy, of course. They have, a, they have a truncated form of empathy. They have a dysfunctional form of empathy. It's empathy that where the emotional component is inaccessible. Mm -hmm. So the narcissist cannot access the emotional part of the empathy. It's there, by the way, but he cannot access it. But he has all the other forms of empathy, reflexive and cognitive. You basically realize what can happen as a result of your actions. But you you cannot understand how, how can I abuse how can I abuse you if I have no empathy with you? Yes. So the narcissist abuses his empathy to scan to find out your vulnerabilities and your soft spots and your buttons, and he will then use this information to victimize you. Mm -hmm. But you need empathy to victimize someone else. If you have nothing in common, I cannot victimize a cockroach. I call it cold empathy, which is the currently being more and more used by Kevin Dutton and others, so called empathy. So it's a form of empathy. So we no longer use the nine criteria. This is uh, history. And if you want to know if someone online knows what he's talking or she's talking about, whether she has a doctorate or not, if she mentions the nine criteria, she's yeah. 20 years behind the times. I understood. So the alternative model puts emphasis on dimensions, mm -hmm. dimensions of personality. For example, the inability to maintain a stable identity, also known as identity disturbance. Mm -hmm. The need for others, the dependence on others in order to regulate a sense of self-worth. Uh, the inability to maintain intimacy. The total lack of interest, the total lack of real and true interest in the so-called intimate partner. I call it insignificant other not significant other, but insignificant other. So the alternative model is much closer to reality. For example, the alternative model mentions that narcissists can go through periods of depression, mm -hmm. which was absolutely, I mean, the nine criteria, they tell you that narcissists are always happy. They're always perfectly, it's not true. Majority of narcissists go through massive depression, I'm especially when they cannot obtain supply. I'm imagining now, that if you have a hard time, sorry for interrupting you, but if you have a hard time, let's say, and you don't have the narcissistic supply, I'm imagining that the life crisis seems bigger for the narcissist because you're... There are two types. There, Collapsing there narcissist. Are two types of, uh, there are two types of uh, dysphoric problems. The one is narcissistic injury, which is short term, and usually the narcissist is okay. able to overcome it or compensate for it by devaluing the source of the injury. Mm -hmm. They will say, the guy, the, girl, the guy who told me that I'm an idiot is an idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the girl, the girl who rejected me is stupid and blind. She didn't realize my value, etc. So that's easy. What is much more difficult is narcissistic mortification. Mm -hmm. Narcissistic mortification is when the narcissist is shamed and humiliated in public in front of people that he values for some reason. Mm -hmm. People who can give him supply, for example, or his role model. So when this happens, there is a process of modification, which is a form of decompensation. The defenses of the narcissist stop, they're inactivated, and he doesn't have the false self of the grandiosity to protect him. So he becomes a borderline, in effect. But this is he, always followed by rage? No, rage is following injury. Yeah. In, injury is followed by rage. Mortification is followed by depression so severe that it is life-threatening the suicidal ideation and so on. So clinically, the narcissist becomes a borderline. He flips. Now, this, this was first described by Grosschein, who was a scholar of personality disorder. Grosschein said that children who are traumatized, are all of them, 
try to become narcissists. Narcissism is the best defense against trauma and abuse, the best. So everyone wants to go for the best. The child tries to become a narcissist, but some children fail. Mm -hmm. And the children who fail become borderlines or codependents. Mm -hmm. So when, I, when the narcissist defenses are removed, he regresses, he goes back. Mm -hmm. And he goes back to being a borderline in effect. So he becomes suicidal. He suddenly has access to his emotions and they overwhelm him. They're dysregulated. And so it's a very dangerous phase. But their alternative model is much more human. For example, the alternative model describes that there are narcissists who are very bad at obtaining supply. And so they are envious and they're passive aggressive and so on. And, and if you want a true picture of narcissism, you would go to the alternative one. The list that was compiled for the DSM, the nine criteria, exploitation, for example, is in the nine criteria. Some narcissists exploit, some don't. Some help, use you and me. Some help, because this is their grandiosity to say, I'm a moral Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. I'm a moral person. I'm help Look at me. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm amazing. I can no? be your example. Yes, I'm a role model. I'm amazing. Am I not? You know? So these criteria are very primitive and they reflected the state of knowledge in 2000, which was zero, in 1994, which was zero. So this is an answer to your question. Uh, one thing that I think of when I think of romantic relationship, it's a parable in the Bible with the honey inside the dead lion. Why do I make it? Maybe it is blunt, but it's something that I think that he tastes it. When you taste for the first time the romantic partner, I have the impression that everything is grandiose, like the narcissist, amazing. Does this always happen? It's a pattern? Like the phase of idealization, is it always huge, like you're my soulmate, you're, or can it be a bit deflated? Because this was my sense. No. I met several narcissists, which I had no engagement. Huh? I had only one relationship with one. But the, the thing that united them was this, the, the sense of soulmate, grandiose. Bigger, bigger than life, bigger than life. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but listen what uh, Sam said before. Narcissists have called empathy. Mm -hmm. They know what you need. And in order to idealize how good they are, how good, uh, what a choice he made by choosing smart woman, beautiful woman, helpful woman, idealize her. He, of course, he will, he will uh, uh, be the best lover and attentive. And uh, this love bombing and romance, of course, but until when? That's the thing. Question. Until, I, uh, so... Uh, uh, let him say his story, but only because many women are saying that. How come in the beginning, uh, I it was like this, and now what happened? That he devalues me, he insults me, he beats me, sometimes physical. Mm -hmm. There is emotional abuse, what which is worse. They triangulate, but they don't understand. Is whenever narcissist feels uh, that he doesn't get from that idealized woman as much as they feel like they deserve. They deserve, they think they deserve, but that is another topic. <laughs> Co-idealization is an element, of course, uh, but it's a, a tactical element. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's much, much deeper than this. When the narcissist sees a woman, I'm talking about men and women, although today 50% of diagnosed narcissists are women, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. The first time in, in human history. The incidence Social and media. prevalence of narcissism, um, the incidence and prevalence of narcissism among women is increasing much more than among men, much more. And the number of psychopathic women is beginning to equal the number of psychopathic men. And if we add borderline personality disorder, which is a form of secondary psychopathy, Maybe. there are more yeah. psychopathic women than men today. So the picture is really bad. We'll not go into the reason why. But I will use men and women mm -hmm. just for discussion's sake. Although the reverse is also true. Mm -hmm. 
the man identifies a woman who has a self-love deficit. Mm -hmm. She was never, never able to love herself because she had not been loved unconditionally. She had not been seen or reflected properly. She was not able to develop boundaries, so she doesn't know where she ends and others begin. Mm -hmm. So she is, of course, you are unable to love yourself mm -hmm. if you don't have a self. And when you don't have boundaries, you don't have a self. You have a cloud. You're like in the cloud. A label. So self. weak self. So these people, these people, these women have never experienced self-love. Never. The narcissist provides them with fake ersatz self-love. The narcissist comes to such a woman and immediately idealizes her because of the process of co-idealization. And he does it through love bombing and grooming. And so he idealizes her. And he creates this idealized image. And then what he does, he shows this idealized image to the woman. He makes the woman gaze at this idealized image. Mm -hmm. And of course, the woman falls in love with her own idealized image. The women don't fall in love with the narcissist. It's a crucial thing to understand. A projection. They fall in love with how the narcissist sees them. Mm -hmm. They fall in love with the idealization, with the fact that the narcissist is idealizing them. It's intoxicating to be idealized by someone. It's an unprecedented phenomenon because for the first time, you're allowed to love yourself and you experience self-love. But it's you're loving not yourself. Mm -hmm. You're loving a fake version of yourself, an idealized version. And so it, after this, this is becoming addictive. You become addicted to it. I want to make the question to, sorry to interrupt you, but I heard a specialist pinpointing the idea of peptide addiction. Oh, peptide I'm sorry? addiction, I think. Peptide okay. addiction, I think they called it. What you're saying, Peptide. the dependence that you grow with the narcissist, please elaborate on this. I'm not, I never heard of peptide addiction, but uh, addiction. But So what can I add here? This is known as process addiction, yeah. if, you, if you're looking for the clinical first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a process addiction. Uh, for example, uh, when, what he said, that uh, a woman, did, was in a uh, 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 narcissist sick uh, and they bond with, and it's easiest for them to bond with uh, insecure, insecure women. Insecure, what does it mean insecure? Insecure in what? In whom? What I mentioned in the beginning, it's uh, uh, they recognize our weaknesses. All people have weaknesses. Not trusting themselves, doubting themselves. Except so me. Are, Except me. I don't agree. <laughs> yeah. They are. They are unstable. They are uh, not unstable, mm -hmm. but they can be stable for some things, certain for some things. Mm -hmm. But there is, uh, there is, uh, uh, like you know, like e uh, ECG. You know, mm -hmm. they are not constant. It's difficult for them to find balance. To balance the positive and negative emotions they have. They don't have, uh, they need, uh, uh, they, they seek validation from other people. If they grew up with narcissistic parents, hmm. at least one of them, uh, uh, the narcissistic parents influence uh, uh, creates this trauma bonding, what you mentioned before. What does it mean? that uh, uh, I was, for example, never validated by my mother that I was uh, doing good. She never said it to me. She never said it. And I, it was like a cloud over my head that I was not good enough person. We all seek validation from other people to be a good people. We are accepted in the environment. We are socially accepted and we they stabilize us they stabilize us we need each other to regulate and control our urges needs and so on uh, so when there is a weakness in a person uh, they are uncertain about many things 
they have a question about themselves. Since if, and if, especially if they miss validation from a parent or significant other, uh, then there is a uh, much, much strong, uh, uh, there are many more actually narcissistic tendencies and uh, traits were developed later in life. And if they were not regulated by their peers, teachers, other influences outside the family, then they, are, uh, they turn out to be with MPD, with narcissistic personality disorder. What are you? Emotionally, they end up even like psychopaths. And uh, the thing is, if there is no constant, constant uh, validation, uh, then there is, uh, there is this gap. Okay. What Sam says, I, uh, the, a person, I, for example, like, okay, I don't value myself. My, uh, I have a low self-esteem. I don't trust myself. Okay, so, but I, I am aware of my senses. Mm -hmm. So I know how to connect with people. It's easy. It's like talk, you know, I want to be needed. I want to be wanted and everything. And I give in the validation part mm -hmm. that you're beautiful that you are clever, that you can do things, that, you're, that you know how to be independent emotionally and financially. What is the work of a parent? It's seen from the eyes uh, of a narcissist because narcissists are successful in, uh, and especially psychopaths, that they have goals. They, they have a goal to become billionaires, they will become billionaires. They will step on everything, but they will turn out to, to become what they really want because of this uh, sustaining their own image. Otherwise, they will not feel that they exist. So uh, what the, the codependent, weak person misses is the so-called strength of a narcissist. You understand? So uh, uh, they fit, they're perfect match. Yeah, they Narcissists and borderliners are perfect match. So they're, uh, the narcissist, uh, the, I, I say, uh, it's pleasant to see someone needs me, wants me, mm -hmm. you know, reflected uh, in, in the eyes of a narcissist. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for that. Okay. I as beside the abuse, the neglect, and everything. Because when I catch myself mm -hmm. loving myself as I was presented, mm -hmm. and then I say, but it's not me, that, uh, that makes a resonance, uh, dissonance. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, they, are, they challenge me, okay, me as Lydia, okay? Uh, they challenge me, narcissists challenge me to know more about myself, mm -hmm. my needs. Actually, I, uh, I, I'm grateful that they are in my life because I need, I have a need to prove my worth. And I have a need to validate my emotions because I once lacked. Um, and in the book, Regarding families, you explain to the par parent who is not a narcissist how he should uh, he or she should act with the ch child, and you also mentioned that some narcissists love children and some actually are uh, mesmerized by the idea of having them because it's like an extension of their super ego. So wh why what would you advise a parent who has the relationship with a narcissist to behave with the child? The only thing to do is to not be a narcissist. The child needs to see two models. One model is a narcissistic parent and another alternative model of a healthy, functional, non-narcissistic parent. When the child grows, when the child is 18 years old, it's a struggle because for, um, for a long period of time, the child will choose the narcissistic parent. Yeah. And the child will choose a narcissistic parent because there are two phases in personal development which are highly narcissistic. For example, adolescence. Adolescence is highly narcissistic. So during adolescence, the child is much more likely to imitate the narcissistic parent to 
love and to choose the narcissistic parent over the non-narcissistic mm -hmm. parent, and it's very painful. But after a certain age, when the child becomes an adult, in most, in the vast majority of cases, the, the child usually um, chooses the non-narcissistic parent and the non-narcissistic personality. So the parent must be there for the child and demonstrate to the child time and again, regardless of the pain, demonstrate again and again, there is an alternative. You don't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. You can behave differently. Not by criticizing the other parent, because this will push the child even more to the other parent. But just by being yourself, by presenting an alternative, there's nothing else that can be done. Yes. End of story. All the other advice is nonsensical or counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And you have to wait. If you were stupid enough to bring children to the world with a narcissist, this is your punishment. You have to wait and hope for the best. I'm saying stupid enough to bring a child to the world with a narcissist because the overwhelming vast majority of people realize that something is wrong with a partner on a third date or second date. Why the, this, these lies, this nonsense, he was a good actor, I didn't see it coming. This is self-deception. People are so terrified of being lonely that they lie to themselves. They know something is wrong and they choose to remain in the relationship. And then they choose a year later to have a child with this monster. Mm -hmm. Well then, every act has consequences and, and costs. Yeah, but more, more addictive to see yourself after so many years that you did not accept yeah. through the eyes. So finally I love myself. Yeah. He did so good and you start to develop this. I and must you have to have a child with this person. Men don't know that. But this is uh, after I spoke to many women. I said, how come you chose to have a, a child with him? Even after you were physically abused, you knew that he was a psychopath. You know, why you chose? Because now even there are, there are studies. If uh, the amygdala is the, 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 the empathy thing in the brain, right? Uh, if uh, uh, amygdala is missing in the, in the psychopath, so why even... Uh, not to be aware of something, you know, like that. So your child will be, might, 50%, right? Have uh, become a psychopath. Don't you think about it? Many women don't, because they are more addicted to capture, to have uh, uh, like a, uh, something that will remind them constantly of that love that they had with the nurses, the psychopath the child, they will see the child and they will always be reminded how sick some women are. This is something that I'm telling you from a, a mother that uh, uh, what she told me. I love that child, even if it is a child of a psychopath that he ended up in jail and I don't know if he will be released. But uh, I see myself as a part. I remember the good times and the love bombing and everything. Mm -hmm. As, uh, and what is it good in it? He be, uh, he is four years old and violent, aggressive. What to do with such uh, people? You know. So women, uh, really, as some said, uh, turn out to be more narcissistic than men. More narcissistic, like oh, we are we are abused, and this is it. Everyone is a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Narcissists do the same. Mm -hmm. They shift blame to others. Yeah, yeah. So if I was narcissistically injured, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to blame someone else. I will say, why on earth this is happening? And I will ask myself, mm -hmm. why do I feel like that? Why women don't do that anymore? Awesome. They used to do that, not anymore. Mm -hmm. They used to do that, not anymore. So it is. Uh, I think that the narcissism, as I said in the beginning, it's our choice. How we process, we, do we want to learn more about ourselves mm -hmm. and self-regulate mm -hmm. our emotions, validate our emotions, or we will seek other people to do that for us. It's a mother's, mother's, only mother's job to teach a child in the formative years to make this different. And to choose. Yes, as Sam said, give you the option. 
to do everything. Narcissist, narcissistic mother or father, doesn't matter. Just to uh, be exposed to experience differences. The child to be given a chance by itself to see and notice differences. And that is the only, the only thing to prevent in effect narcissism because life experience is life experience this mm -hmm. is uh, learned experience i mean learned and we we make and we create new habits we have our uh, uh, when we start to believe in uh, some rhythm we become uh, uh, we have ritual you know and these are stabilizing factors our beliefs our uh, routines stabilized us emotionally. Also, we feel much safer and more secure, more protected. And if any other, no other person, including some uh, parents, nor any, uh, any partner in life, no friends will do this for you. The times are changing. You have friends, you don't have friends. You can trust them, you can't trust them. They are changing also. The only certainty is your choice. The choices that you decide mm -hmm. and you can rely on. So it's about trusting yourself. Yeah. So more it's more sustainable. Some I and let, and hurts less. <laughs> I have a question regarding what she said, shifting to friends. Um, so they normally have followers, not not so many friends. Given that narcissists are people of habit, like they have the ritual, but they seem very hectic from outside. Is it common for each type of narcissist not to lose the circle of friends or the followers, but after he feels uh, intimacy, he feels engulfed and then goes to another circle of followers and so on and so forth. So have you seen narcissists really developing relationships with other people than the insignificant other? two years like 20 years of following friendship or not do they do they permanently change the the background of friends no narcissists do not do not experience engulfment and anxiety engulfment anxiety is borderline mm -hmm. borderlines have a con have a conflict between abandonment anxiety mm -hmm. the clinical term is uh, separation insecurity mm -hmm. So they have a conflict between separation and security and engulfment anxiety. Mm -hmm. They get close to you because they're afraid that you will abandon them. Mm -hmm. But the minute you show love and intimacy, they run away they because afraid. they are afraid that you will engulf them. You will en they you get enmeshed. So this is borderlines, not narcissists. And narcissists? Narcissists, um, narcissists are children who were not allowed to develop boundaries. They were not allowed to separate from the mother. Physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse is a form of breaching boundaries, but also spoiling the child, using the child as a tool, forcing the child to become a parent, parentifying the child. These are all forms of breaching of boundaries, not allowing the child to become an individual, separation, individuation. So narcissists, because they had never had boundaries, are not recognizing the boundaries of others. They don't, ne they have never experienced boundaries firsthand. So they don't understand boundaries with others. Mm -hmm. Consequently, they cannot be friends and they cannot love. Love and friendship, which are very, very similar emotions. Now we are discovering friendship is a form of love. Actually, it is love mm -hmm. only without the sexual context. And even that is not true all the time. Mm -hmm. But love and friendship are founded on boundaries. You cannot love another person if you don't have boundaries. Mm -hmm. Because to love another person is to recognize that the other person is not you. To recognize the other person is special, unique, separate from you. Otherwise, how can you love? If you don't have boundaries, the only form of love is self-love because you can't love. All right. And even when you love another person, you're actually loving yourself because you can't recognize the separateness of the other person. So narcissists never have friends and are never capable of loving. Now what narcissists do, they establish something which, which I called 
pathological narcissistic space. It's a physical or digital environment mm -hmm. where the narcissist has constant admirers and fans and followers. And this environment can be stable because narcissists have what I call island of stability. Mm -hmm. Some narcissists, for example, have stable marriages for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, mm -hmm. but they change 40 jobs. Mm -hmm. So they are not stable in the workplace, but they're stable in the marriage. Other narcissists are exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. They work for one company for 40 years, but they had divorced six times. Mm -hmm. There's always a locus of stability because the narcissist needs to feel safe somewhere. The locus of stability can be the pathological narcissistic space. In other words, the narcissist can have a, a stable set of admirers for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. Same people, always admiring him, always adulating him, and he will stick with them for life. But at the same time, the rest of his life will be highly chaotic, total mess. So this is more or less the answer to your question. In social circles, like not the personal relationship, what I, I took from, I used to be a model, and it was like you mentioned in the book, the situation of narcissism. It was strange that there were so many projections around me that what I took from the girls from the agency is that most of them didn't have, couldn't stand any type of criticism. So it's like they emulated your, I don't know, your the, fa the way you, you felt, but then when you had any type of criticism, they redrew in the safe space somehow. So any form of criticism was, was seen as a threat. And the second thing, I, I also, I, I, I'm curious if every narcissist lies because sometimes they lied with silly stuff that had no significance, didn't help them. Sometimes the lies made them worse, but I think they, they, they gave them short-term gratification, like they, they could outstand this image that, of omnipotence or like do not seem flawed so i have to lie in order to protect my perfect image and another thing i saw was the comparison so do all narcissists constantly compare themselves well one by one the first issue you raised is known as introjection mm -hmm. when the narcissist comes across you and you can be a source of supply mm -hmm. the narcissist takes a photograph of you mm -hmm. a snapshot and then he internalizes the snapshot. Mm -hmm. And from that, and this process is in, in clinical term is called introjection. He internalizes the snapshot and then he continues to interact with the snapshot, mm -hmm. never with you, never with you. You're not relevant anymore. He continues to interact with the snapshot. He, he photoshops the snapshot mm -hmm. and this is idealization. He photoshops you, makes you look better and so on. And then he continues to interact with the snapshot. The snapshot has a few advantages. It doesn't talk back, it doesn't criticize, it doesn't disagree, and it never abandons the narcissist. Mm -hmm. Narcissists have abandonment anxiety. So the snapshot is safe. You are not safe. You are not safe because you grow, you change, you evolve, you move, you talk to other people, you can you can cheat, you can betray, you can so you're not safe. You snapshot can, is safe, just saying. Just saying. Yeah. Snapshot is safe. So I said it. So the minute you criticize, you deviate from the snapshot. Mm -hmm. the, the minute you disagree, you step aside from the snapshot. There's a gap opening between you and the snapshot. Now, this is the minute you're independent, the minute you make your own choices and decisions, the minute you have your own friends and family, you are deviating from the snapshot. You can no longer be controlled. You're not safe. So you become a persecutory object. Mm -hmm. You become an enemy and the narcissist needs to get rid of you because you are seriously threatening and to do this he devalues you and discards you this is the the process so <coughs> the second question you asked is about lying mm -hmm. narcissists extremely rarely lie mm -hmm. psychopaths do mm -hmm. it's a big confusion online mm -hmm. yes. psychopaths lie a lot because they're goal oriented their lies are goal oriented they want to, to accomplish something Narcissists rarely lie. What narcissists do is another process which looks a lot like lying, but clinically is very different. And it's called confabulation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, narcissists confabulate for two reasons to support their grandiosity mm -hmm. it's a part of a fantasy defense so actually they are fantasizing aloud they're fantasizing aloud and it sounds like they're lying and the second reason they they lie is because they have memory gaps they forget a lot they have what we call dissociation mm -hmm. so they keep forgetting a lot and then they are ashamed to admit that they had forgotten because they know everything. They're like, God, how can it be that they don't know something that had happened to them? Narcissists will never say, I don't remember, I don't know, because it's perfect. So instead, the narcissist says, what could have happened? Mm -hmm. You know, what should have happened? What's the most reasonable, logical, plausible thing that had happened? It's a story that he invents, a narrative. And then he says, ah, well, probably it did happen. I was in point A, now I'm in point C, probably there was point B in the middle. Otherwise, how did I get to C? And then point B becomes reality. He defends the confabulation as though it were real. And if you challenge him, he becomes aggressive. He refuses to admit that he invented the confabulation because he doesn't feel that he invented it. He feels it's real. So narcissists don't lie. Or rarely, of course they lie, everyone lies, but like not as a strategy. That is psychopaths. The last thing is comparison. So narcissists, it is another myth that narcissists need to be the best, the most, the greatest. That's not true. Narcissists need to be unique. So they can be a unique loser, mm -hmm. a unique failure, a unique victim. Most Many narcissists will tell you that they are unique victims and many victims online are actually narcissists covert narcissists mm -hmm. their victimhood is their grandiosity they're grandiose because there has never been a victim like them they are the the number one victim ever you could be number one loser you just need to be number one mm -hmm. you don't have to be the best the strongest the most powerful the richest no you can be the poorest man on earth if you are number one and only sui generis, this is grandiosity. Okay, now if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, those two masks you mentioned in the book, these are common for all types, the two masks. The two masks of what, I'm sorry? Of narcissism, like the yes. Ferus Eternus, the Eternal Child, and the second one. The wound, Wunderkind, yes. Mm -hmm. But what, what is the question? So you can recognize them in each narcissist. The wunderkind and the... No, the wunderkind is more typical of cerebral. Mm -hmm. uh, the puera eternus, mm -hmm. Peter Pan, mm -hmm. the eternal adolescent, uh, is, uh, is all narcissists, yes. Mm -hmm. All narcissists are immature, they're childlike, they're infantile, they're regressive. So all narcissists are actually children. Prone to hedonism. Yeah, they're children, actually. And, uh, In old age. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but the wunderkind is unique to unique to the cerebral. The cerebral is was a wonder 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 child, you know, wonder boy. Uh, what I liked from the book, I think I have just two or three questions left. But one was that I, I started to recognize some patterns when I read the part with the sexual communicators, the three types, and I, I recognized some major differences between uh, the three types, which maybe you could shed light on better than me. Well, there are those who go from uh, from sex to commitment and those who go from commitment to sex. Mm -hmm. And today, both styles are very widespread. So uh, the book needs a revision because <laughs> when I had written the book, yeah, one of the styles was considered socially acceptable and the other style was considered uh, dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. But today there is a pandemic of emotionless sex, sex that is totally physiological release, mm -hmm. masturbatory sex with the body of your partner, sex that does not recognize your partner as an autonomous independent entity. Mm -hmm. In short, narcissistic sex. Mm -hmm. Sex, narcissistic sex is autoerotic. Mm -hmm. Narcissistic sex is about self gratification. Even when you gratify the partner, it's because you want to feel that you are great at sex. 
So you have, ironically, narcissists who ask during the sex, if it's... Um, how many times did you orgasm? Am I not the best you ever had? You know? So even when there is an interest in the partner, it's totally grandiose and, and self-centered. Um, and this, I'm saying it's a pandemic yeah, the poor. Because, because lately in studies like Lisa Wade, Kerry Cohen and many others, we are discovering that the majority, and when I say majority, I mean super majority, 81% mm -hmm. of, of women, for example, majority of people experience only casual sex, only one night stands. Majority of people nowadays do not experience sex in relationships with any meaningful other. Almost all of them have sex only with strangers and in 20% of the time, they don't know the names so of no. the strangers. The names, mm -hmm. not uh, any other detail. 20%, 81% of women have exclusively casual sex, 45% of people, men and women, had never had a relationship of any kind for any duration. That's a picture in all age groups. It's a horrifying picture. I'm guessing pornography and everything online dating plays a big part in this. Pornography with men and men are becoming much more aggressive. If you date a man today, you are fully expected to have sex on the first date. And if you don't, he becomes violent and aggressive. And you are, you are a, a crazy bitch mm -hmm. if you don't have sex on the first date. There is an ethos that sex, even with total strangers, is just fun and games and play. And of course, it's, this is totally nonsensical mm -hmm. because sex has huge physiological, hormonal, and mental health implications. Mm -hmm. Even casual sex, even one night stand. So, Today, there would be no distinction between sexual communicator and non-sexual communicator. Everything is down the drain. Everything is lost. We don't have a situation where there's a small minority, let's say 10% or 2% or 20% who are having sex. Everyone, <coughs> that's it, it's gone. The connection between sex and intimacy, yeah. sex and relationships, sex and the art of life. Because mm -hmm. the art of life is about compromising, mm -hmm. about being together, about sharing. This connection is gone simply gone. We even have shocking testimonies. For example, Lisa Wade conducted studies where, we, where young women were saying, I don't have sex with my boyfriend. I love him. I'm intimate with him. Of course, I don't have sex with him. I mean, it's totally, we have new phenomenon where 40% of, of women, girls under the age of 16, 14%, one, of, one in seven had sex with multiple men simultaneously, usually an average of 10 men, simultaneously. This is known as a train. Yeah, that, 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 that's mind-boggling for me. I hope I'm not that old, but it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm processing the information in real time. Uh, you, you mentioned that you actually know from the first date. Uh, you have a lot of books from The Body Keeps the Score to other books. Uh, that mention like the bad vibes topic, a thing which I started to sense at the end of my narcissistic relationship. So I was blunt because I myself did, haven't done the inside work to see the triggers, the mechanisms, which I also had defense mechanisms. And at the end, it was so strong that I got to the ER two times just by facing the narcissist in real life. Having, I actually didn't felt rage or anything. I, I felt relief when he went away because I felt so bad. Do you, uh, what do you think about the bad vibes? I would, I would let Lydia answer after no, me. No, 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 no. I will, I will let her no, Lydia give her some space after. Uh, but I, but just here, after please, me, after, but, after, yeah. just a after that, you can describe ah, what no. you felt. On our first meeting, you felt bad vibes. So yes. It's useful to describe. Yeah, yeah, actually, because I want to know if it's a thing or not. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely a thing. Uh, the information relevant to making a healthy decision mm -hmm. is available within minutes. Okay. The narcissist breaks your, breaches your boundaries, is in your face, makes decisions for you, mm -hmm. ignores you as a separate entity, uses you as an extension within the first five minutes. Literally. Sure. You don't want to 
accept it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to realize it. Because, for example, maybe you're lonely. Mm -hmm. But there's an even deeper reason. In many cases, this creates parental resonance. Mm -hmm. You had been exposed to narcissists in your life in the past, upon which you were dependent emotionally, financially, or otherwise. And so you are coming across a parental figure. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we had documented very widely is that children will never say that the mo mother is bad, father is bad. Mm -hmm. The child will say, I am bad. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with me. So when you come across a parental figure in the form of a narcissist and you get the bad vibes, mm -hmm. you will not say something's wrong with him because he's a parent. You will say, something must be wrong with me. Why am I reacting like this? Oh, I was depressed. I had bad news from work. Uh, I'm in a bad mood. Something's wrong with me. We call this autoplastic defense. Mm -hmm. So you will develop autoplastic neurotic defenses. It will take a long time for you to get rid of these defenses and admit to the truth. But you have all the information in the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. He orders wine for you without asking you. Mm -hmm. he, he asks you intrusive questions after you come back from the toilet. Mm -hmm. He is jealous. He shouts at the, at the waiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humiliates the taxi driver. You have all the clues. You have everything you need to know within five minutes. You are just denying it. You are in self-denial. You suspect uh, you you suspect yourself first. Mm -hmm. You suspect yourself, but here in the book he mentions the the two types, which I'm actually three types. You mentioned three terms. Interesting, all of them. The MPD by proxy, the sensitive sensitized ones and the desensitized ones so here you can elaborate as you wish people who had been repeatedly exposed to narcissistic abuse or to narcissists it's a little like being exposed to snake venom or to any other toxin mm -hmm. you develop immunity and resistance in some ways you become desensitized or you become sensitized and so these people, ironically, at the same time, would be able to spot a narcissist mm -hmm. much more easily, but would have stronger defenses. Mm -hmm. They would lie to themselves more. The same, I mean, it's the two phenomena. Self-deception. Now, this creates dissonance. Mm -hmm. This creates immediately dissonance. We call it cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you know this person is bad for you. And on the other hand, you deny it. Mm -hmm. And so this, the relationship starts off with a, with a dissonance. And it leads, dissonance can be resolved in many ways. And one of the ways to resolve the dissonance is to deny one of the two parts. Mm -hmm. So the preference is to deny that something is wrong with the partner and to autoplastic defense, to, to blame yourself. Another way is to say, well, there is a third reason. It's not that something's wrong with him, but he had a bad day mm -hmm. or his childhood was difficult. And I call it malignant optimism. Justifying. Justifying him somehow. And a third way is a grandiose narcissistic defense. I can fix him. With my love, I will, I will cure him. I will save him. You know? So this creates very unhealthy dynamics, mm -hmm. very dysfunctional dynamics. Ironically, and that's the problem with narcissism, the more you're exposed to narcissists, the less healthy your reaction will be. Not the more, the less healthy. And more narcissistic you become. Yeah, and more narcissistic you become, exactly. And then you yeah. you claim that you are a victim. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's you just... weren't a victim, victim of a narcissist. You became the abuser. Yeah, but it, because you allow it. Mm -hmm. I understand. So the... you can't blame yourself. You have to... Lydia is touching upon a very important point, and that is a con what I call contagion. Narcissism is contagious. Mm -hmm. it, it causes you, it infects you like a virus. It causes you to become more and more narcissistic. Now, it's also a defense mechanism because if you are abused, you have two options. You can say, I'm helpless, mm -hmm. I'm a victim, but who wants that? Yeah, yeah. Another option is to say, I'm going to become the abuser. Mm -hmm. And now that I become the abuser, no one will dare to abuse me anymore. I'm doing the abusing from now on. Yeah. And most victims actually choose the second solution. And just a second, no, just before in the morning, Mm -hmm. 
we were communicating. Mm -hmm. well, he, for, he, for a change, we were communicating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he gave you the example that uh, that mostly women, mm -hmm. there, there were less women who are narcissistic. With this pandemic, they become, this is exactly the reason mm -hmm. that the women became more narcissistic. They are not 35, but they are 50. I, I think that even uh, more. But there is something that is something that I don't like. And I, uh, that is because women uh, be, uh, uh, sense the other and they can be more manipulative, mm -hmm. more goal oriented. And since there are no money, there is no work, there are many, the conditions changed, they became even more psychopathic. This is what I noticed as a trend. And I'm devastated. What I, I the, the, what uh, Sam uh, gave you a taste of a, a, some significant change when a person is alone mm -hmm. and when the person doesn't have stability, where to, where to compare themselves in order to regulate their emotions, you know, have a friend, meet a friend, go out, you know, whatever, some social. Now, now they're gone. Mm -hmm. There was a lockdown. You can see, I felt, and we were discussing, all the fears pop up, all the fears of a human being, mm -hmm. abandoning, uh, uh, fear of, of death, mm -hmm. of, abandon, of, of being abandoned, being alone. What on earth will I do with myself? You know, people didn't know how old they were. Do you, I was, uh, they were not even aware which color they, 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 it was fa their favor. They didn't know many small things about themselves. And this self-depersonalization requires self-defense mechanisms and they became narcissists. This is what happened uh, and why the number increased. I think there's a confluence of two additional social trends. One is women empowerment. Women were mistreated as slaves effectively for millennia. And now they're being liberated and they don't know what to do with their freedom. It's simple. It's such a new condition they're that they have no, no, I don't know if they're bored or not. Bored. They don't know how to do with an, in a new situation. It's a totally new situation to women, never happened before. And they have no clue how to behave in this new situation because it's new. So this is the first uh, thing. And the second thing is, um, the number of women who are refugees from abusive relationships mm -hmm. had exploded. Women are now identifying abuse, mm -hmm. can put, put a name to it. And women are now acting to get out of abusive relationships like never before. Mm -hmm. So we have like hundreds of millions of millions of women who are refugees from abusive relationships. But when they go out of the abusive relationship, they, take, they say to themselves, never again. I will never be abused again. Now I'm free. I'm emancipated. I'm liberated. I'm powerful. I'm empowered. And I will never be abused again. But because they don't know how to behave with this newfound power and newfound freedom, they choose male models. They become men. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, men abuse me. I will now become a man. So no one will abuse me anymore. And they don't choose good men, hardworking men, loving men. They choose bullies, narcissists, and psychopaths as a role model. So women who, who are refugees from abusive relationships tend, this is fact, by the way, it's documented by Judith Herman and many others, they tend to become narcissistic and psychopathic in behavior, at least, maybe not psychologically, but behaviorally. They tend to become narcissists, narcissists and psychopaths. It's exceedingly dangerous trend. Anyone who is on the dating side claims that today, broken, damaged women and so on are highly narcissistic and psychopathic. Every man is claiming, just go online. And, and these women are also extremely likely to give up on men mm -hmm. at some point. They say, okay, now I'm independent, autonomous, I don't need men. I don't need men anymore. I'm going to use them like sex toys. That's it. If I need sex, I don't even need sex. They flip. 
And they, that's it, they're lost. They're lost to the gender. There is a group of men who are reacting the same. These men consider themselves refugees from abusive relationships. And so these men are together in a manosphere. Miktau, mm -hmm. men going their own way, incels and so on. These are men, these are the mirror image of these women. Mm -hmm. They regard themselves as refugees from abuse. And so they now become narcissistic and psychopath. We have polarization mm -hmm. of narcissists, women narcissists and psychopaths, mm -hmm. and men narcissists and psychopaths, mm -hmm. giving up on each other, mm -hmm. becoming enemies, and starting a war. It's absolute war now between men and women. Sorry. No, I wanted to capsulate, uh, but uh, it's okay. I, I, I tend to finish something, you know, just for if you remember, to put it in a in a sentence or in one sentence. No, but I forgot it. I forgot it. Good, good that you forgot it. Was very very good. I don't want to complicate things. So there is another thing you can notice. If someone complicates uh, the language, the explanation so much, yeah, then it, it most probably. 80% is a narcissist. One sentence, simple, keep it simple. It's a clever, it's not grandiose, but clever, smart, boy, girl, whatever. That's true. Narcissists have uh, specific speech patterns. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, when you say specific speech pattern, do you refer to I, 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 the self referencing, or also this is only one? This is pronoun density. Mm -hmm. Pronoun density is one hallmark of uh, narcissistic speech, but no, not only. Narcissistic speech is intended to impress, not to communicate. Mm -hmm. Narcissistic speech obfuscates reality. The main role is to hide reality, to cast like you, in effect. Mm -hmm. Narcissistic speech is, contains a lot of inconsistencies. So the narcissist can co contradict himself <laughs> in one sentence. He can start with su something. Oh, okay, like... let's, keep it, uh, let's keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> but after the conversation, after the conversation, when you when you ask yourself what was all this all about and you don't have an answer, it's for sure you did not understand the narcissist. It was a narcissistic person that you so you know uh, nor uh, 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 people speak directly. Mm -hmm. They don't need audience. They don't need to prolong. Where's the point? Give me the point. It can be. It can be said in a sentence or two, in one paragraph. A narcissist will write a Bible out of it. I mean, a book, 10 books for one issue. And again, on the end, you will not understand something. Well, the, so, book, the book, your book, Sam, the one I read, but you have many others I would like in the end. Who is the editor? Who is <laughs> this is what I wanted to say. This is why you are... Uh, a perfect match because the book is so well written so full of information but it does not make you lose a train of the events not one second it's so well comprised and meant because she edited it so it worked no no it's a joke it's uh really what uh there was it was also contribution to all this uh ask questions so i published uh, the book i opened the website for that uh for, for it 97 but the frequently asked questions were added and only after two years, it was published as a book. So there is, this is actually the beauty. It's not a narcissist only that wrote it. It's not only that Experience. who knows who edited it, but there is a component of other people's needs, the human element, the human touch. That's why it, 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 it is, uh, there is also variety. Uh, many subjects are are included, uh, reframed, you know, and that's why so many people, uh, you know, uh, resonate. Some elements resonate with different people. There are different topics. So what is needed for, uh, again, I will say, mm -hmm. expose yourself to differences. Mm -hmm. So via your experience, you will know uh, uh, you will know to, to select. Mm -hmm. You were offered, and it's your choice, free choice, not by a narcissistic mother or narcissistic husband, your choice. Mm -hmm. And that gives value to any person, mm -hmm. every person. And it's a stabilizing. 
because you went through it. Just narcissists don't remember what they went through. That's why that is the handicap. And I don't mind serving at an external desk, memorizing the gaps while he dissociates or what, what he missed. But I don't mind, you know, it's, it's uh, not that he is using me and abusing me. He took me to those trips for me to sense. It's so what not, why not to share? Why I'm asking this. Why some women, that is what, what I appreciate him for. He, and he is honest. And I feel safe and secure. Actually, I know how he functions. I noticed the sign. Yesterday, I saw him. I said, why are you so stressed? Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't have an answer. He slept over. And he said, this is what I read. You know, and it was really stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 some summary. Mm -hmm. and it, but I thought, because of my background, that I was the one who did something bad. And okay, so uh, if you, anyone that lives with a narcissist, have to have to use the senses, mm -hmm. but not to manipulate in order to materialistically, as many women do, mm -hmm. uh, abuse, because uh, most of the women who complain and who are victims are saying that their, that their husband was jealous. Well, they were pretty lazy to learn something and they stayed at home and acted as housewives yeah. and good mothers. You know, so first, you know, it's important to, to hear uh, to hear the story and to be a little bit, you know, uh, tactical mm -hmm. with everyone, with a victim, with a narcissist. We all need, we all have our ups and downs, right? But it will be fair, fair if everyone will have the how you say in the brokerage a good share the best share you know communication mm -hmm. and you agree and you you live together without hate it's a good uh, state uh, concluding statement we are at two hours i'm afraid yeah it was we reached idea. the two hours yeah. uh, i would you hmm? i would mention the name of the book in the podcast and i thank you very much for your time it was just thank you for having us part of insight if you read some's book edited by Lydia you will get an amazing insight into the world of the narcissist and you also have the frequently asked questions that are from the half of the book I think which are amazing that should answer all of your questions uh, are you planning a revised edition you said we were planning it for a few years already yes. but no time no time well, this uh this pandemic really uh, triggered many people and as I said all all fears I, I won't be surprised if there will be a new one <laughs> people are terrified and uh, they flipped they need help and we are here also for I'm focusing now on the new uh, my my new thinking in philosophy I call it nothingness it's a form of a new philosophy so I'm less into narcissism and so on, but yes, we should come up with a final edition of Malignant Self Love and allow all of us to move on somehow. It's been Thank enough. You. We've been in, we've been doing this for 26 years. It's Thank enough. you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's kind of you to have us. Take care there. All the best. All the best. Bye. Take care.